Let's talk uh, macro environment first. Yeah. Uh, it, stuff's messed up. <laughs> it just seems to be breaking, to say the least. What is your analysis as to like where we are today? Right, like when you yeah. when somebody says to you, "Hey, what's going on in the economic world?" Like, how do you describe where we are? Yeah, well, I think if you zoom out and then zoom out and then zoom out again, right? So a big thesis I've been working on for about a year and a half is like three revolutionary cycles that are converging, that are changing the world. So we have a 250-year political revolution cycle. Every 250 years, the world, the pendulum swings from centralization and swings back to decentralization. Okay. 250 years ago was the American Revolution, pushed back on the centralization of the monarchy, set up a decentralized republic government. 250 years before that, Protestant Reformation. So we have that on this cycle. On an 80-year cycle, there's a financial revolution cycle, 80 years ago, Bretton Woods Agreement, et cetera. On a 50-year cycle, there's a technological revolution cycle every 50 years. There's been five of them, and we're in the sixth one right now. So all three are converging right now. So that's like super high level. When you zoom in, you see that in real life. So we have like this war of globalism right now, the WEF, um, Davos, Europe, right, ECB, et cetera. Um, and so I think the world is breaking apart because of that, because it's on this time frame. And then, of course, it's being exaggerated, played out in real time with Russia, Ukraine, China, supply chains breaking down. Uh, this morning, we saw um, India and a bunch of other countries are banning exports of food. So now countries are starting to hoard food, hoard precious metals, hoard commodities. And so it's starting to break apart really, really quick. Has there ever been a point in time where those three cycles, the 250 year, the 80 year and the 50 year cycles all converged around the same time point? Yeah, back in uh, back at the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s. And so what was uh, kind of your analysis of, okay, these three things converged. What happened then? Uh, well, the the world swings back to decentralization, right? So uh, things start getting uh, more and more centralized central planners, right? More control. And then it starts breaking apart. So um, the last 250 years, we've been on the path to centralization. Mm -hmm. So we went from the industrial revolution led to that, right? So in the, before the industrial revolution, it was agricultural society. So people were just in the farms and cottage industry. And that started bringing people into cities, into factories. Then you had to be in the United States. You had to be in New York. You had to be in Chicago, right? And so it led to that. And now it's starting to swing back the other way. So we haven't really seen this for uh, 250 years. So put the technology piece aside for a second, put the financial uh, component aside. What does that mean for an average person, you know, over the next 10, 20 years? Is it everyone's going to go live out in the woods and, you know, kind of be on their own? And they they, or, own they already are. I mean, look what happened with COVID, right? Because COVID forced people to work from home. So now look at real estate in Colorado or Wyoming or Idaho. People always wanted to live there, but they never were able to. And now real estate there is blowing up because people can go live there now. But not just that. Now they're going into... Um, Cancun in Mexico, they're going to uh, Florinopolis in Brazil, right? So now we're starting to see these areas starting to blow up. So the world will continue to decentralize because people will be able to go live and work in those places. What is the financial impact uh, across asset prices when something like this happens? Well, uh, the you, you said to remove the tech piece, but you can't because the technology is what is is what always changes things. So when you look back through history, it's always technology that drives these. And so these in, these technological revolutions, they're different than technologies. Technology is like an iPhone. I took a computer and a phone, put them together. That's cool. Technological revolution has two main components. One, it changes the course of humanity and it drives financial markets. So there's been five industrial revolution, steam engines and railways, um, steel and electricity, oil, automobiles. And then 1971, the microprocessor, which brought us personal computers, telecommunications, and the internet. So those all changed the course of humanity. I don't need to go through that. But they also drove financial markets. What's been the financial markets the last 40, 50 years? Telecom, internet. What was before that? Ford, GM, GE. What was before that? Steel, oil. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from financial implications for most people, you can see how that's going to start changing. In the shorter term, how is it going to start changing? So as the world starts to break apart, which it already is, it's going to change a lot of things. So for example, just this morning um, and throughout the course of the week, but this morning, Japan announced that they're backing off of their EV mandate. Um, G uh, Germany announced with, I think, three other European countries uh, last week that they also as well. So the, the, the globalists, the European Union have these mandates to transition to EV vehicles, right? Like 100% by 2035. And now they're all backing off of this. So they're like, well, I guess this isn't going to work. We need 60 countries to get the minerals to make one EV vehicle. And now that countries aren't able to cooperate, and a lot of these countries, like I said, are banning exports, I guess this transition probably isn't going to be possible. So now we're starting to revise that. So when it comes to like financial markets, when you're betting on things like EV transitions and booms like that, I think you have to be aware of that. So when you start 
trying to analyze what's happening right now. There is uh, a technology, there's a finance component to it, and then there's this like decentralization component. I mean, the elephant in the room is, it sounds like Bitcoin is a huge piece of that. How do you kind of think through what is occurring in the moment right now? So you, you talked about a, a swing back towards decentralization. Um, what is the technology revolution that's going to change the course of humanity? And like, what is the impact on financial markets then? Well, the... And this is a piece that I talked about at this event I was at this weekend, George Gammon's event. Shout out to Rebel Capitalist. Um, what people are missing, and Lynn Alden put out a quote last week, to equate Bitcoin and crypto shows you don't understand either. And so um, I use that quote in my talk. And there's a technological revolution that's happening here, but most people are blinded to it because of the crypto um, boom and bust that's been happening. Mm -hmm. But there's actually a revolution that's happening. So for the first time ever, we've created digital scarcity. We've created true de decentralization. Um, we've been able to now move into the information age without copying information, which is like incredibly powerful. Now, what does that mean? We don't really know. When steel was invented, it gave us a new material that we could build skyscrapers and bridges with. It also gave us material we could build a space shuttle with, but we didn't know that when steel came out, right? When electricity came out, the first application was a candle. Um, it was like a digital candle, but candles were light for 5,000 years. What do we need that for? But it gave us the building block to do what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And so we have a new set of building blocks. We don't know exactly what will be built off of that. But I think it's a, you know, I would imagine you would agree, it's probably the best risk-adjusted investment that we could make right now if we're willing to wait. So when you use the electricity example or the steel example, those were building blocks, as you mentioned. Um, and in hindsight, we know that, okay, yes, the first applications were interesting, uh, but they were uh, really small compared to what eventually was possible. Is the revolution driven uh, or like the innovation the blockchain? Is it Bitcoin as an application of a blockchain? Like, how do you think through? Because I, I immediately jumped like, okay, what would the critics say of uh, the Bitcoin only viewpoint? They'd be like, yes, of course, the blockchain is the innovation. And then we're going to go put all these different, um, you know, applications and it's a building block and all that. How do you think through, is it actually the blockchain or is it the application of Bitcoin that ends up being the, like the true innovation that serves as the foundation for whatever is to come? I believe that the true innovation is decentralization. Okay, interesting. So how do we achieve decentralization? We achieve decentralization by instead of having one database, we have multiple databases. In order to achieve that, everyone must be able to run a database. Mm -hmm. So with Bitcoin, anyone in a third world country with a five-year-old laptop can download the database and run it. But you can't do that with any other of the other, whatever, 19,000 coins. And so the, the, the innovation is decentralization. And I believe there's only one that really gives us that. Because it's not, it's not just decentralization, though, right? It's like a technology-coordinated decentralization that is operating uh, – like my mind jumps to uh, Balaji Srinivasan's whole idea of like you know the, these uh, cloud-based economies, right? Or these right. cloud-based societies where uh, really the decentralization is the ability to coordinate via technology across the world in a digital format. I don't think that's it. Okay, explain. And Balaji is super smart, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. shout out to him. He's, he's like a walking encyclopedia. He's insane, right? Um, but I don't think that's it, right? I think what it really is, is it's it's decentralization that makes it where nobody controls the ledger. Mm -hmm. It's all about the ledger, right? If I have a coin um, and I give you the coin, you have the coin. If I have the coin, I have the coin. But if we do it in an information age, we need a ledger that shows who has the coin. Yep. Now, who controls the ledger? That's the crux of the matter, right? So I think uh, the oldest problem that mankind has had is how do I protect my property from being stolen? So mm -hmm. we make a, a tribe, a village, a kingdom, a country. But now if nobody can control the ledger, then nobody can steal my asset. And if I want to send it to you, nobody can stop it, block it, prevent it. So digital coordination is great. Don't get me wrong. It's going to be massive for production and, and things like that. And of course, when we have this globalization, we can all collaborate together and we can get more progress. That's awesome. That's great. But that that doesn't prevent people from manipulating manipulating the ledger. Yeah, I think we're saying the exact same thing, which is uh, there's only one truly decentralized uh, ledger today, right, in terms of the ability to know what I have is I have. And if I send it to you, no one can stop me, right? right? There's a lot that aspire to do that, claim to do it, whatever. But there's only one that is truly decentralized. Uh, when I was talking about this kind of like cloud economy or whatever, it's just now we have the ability in a digital format. Um, if you think of uh, Balaji's uh, whole idea of like, there's going to be three currencies in the future. There's like the United States dollar, uh, there's the Chinese, and then there's Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. And it's like one of those three ends up quote unquote winning. 
I think you and I both lean towards, well, the decentralized well, and, and there'll version. be many, there'll be many, right? I mean, think about the dollar took over the reserve currency of the world from the pound sterling, but that was a 40 year process, right. but the pound sterling is still being used yes. today. It's really hard to kill currencies. <laughs> right. It's really hard to kill currency. So I think, I, I believe as the world moves to become more decentralized, instead of the one, de one reserve currency of the world, everyone's waiting for the final moment it's decentralized. So maybe my reserve is different. Maybe Michael strategy's reserve is different. Maybe El Salvador's reserve is different, but other people use other things. So this is an interesting point. So you think that as we move more and more towards a decentralized world, it won't be one single global reserve currency, whether that's Bitcoin or a fiat currency. You think actually that there will be many reserve currencies and it's almost like choose your own adventure. What is the currency that you need and which one do you choose as your reserve currency? Well, which nation puts 100% of their reserves in one asset mm -hmm. today? None. None. Yeah. None. They all use multiple reserves, right? So we saw Russia, what happened with Russia, they had their FX reserve seized, which were multiple currencies, not just one, multiple currencies, but they also had other assets, commodities, et cetera. So no country puts 100% of the reserves into one thing. So I think we're looking at it from the wrong perspective by doing that. Um, the BIS put out this piece last week. I'm sure you saw because I know you're all over the news. But the BIS put out, out this piece and he talked about the soul of money. Um, and he said the soul of money is based off trust. And uh, for whatever centuries, we've trusted central bankers. First of all, money has no soul. But I do believe money is based off of trust. And I think what happened with Russia, Ukraine, and the and the world, basically, not just the U.S., but the world moving against Russia's FX reserve was more profound than most people think because it was the death of trust. And if you've ever been in a relationship with a, a, a girlfriend, a partner, a wife, a business partner, whatever, when trust is lost, trust is lost. And I think the world just realized that we can't trust whoever holds the ledger. What, why do you think it was so profound? Explain more in detail in terms of like what you think the ramifications of all these financial sanctions against Russia are. Well, because uh, as I said, we seized, we, the whatever, the world, there was multiple currencies, but their FX reserves were seized, frozen. And so that money was on this global ledger through the SWIFT system, the payment system, and it was just frozen and seized. And so how can we trust our money if it can just be taken away? Did you see uh, the commentary from Vladimir Putin uh, last week? It was translated, and, and I always caveat this with, uh, we have to accept it as uh, fact based on the information we have today. If somebody disproves it later or something, uh, I don't speak Russian. Yeah, so, I don't speak so, Russian either. Right, right, so I'm somewhat relying on the translations, but it was a fairly well-articulated, pretty honest assessment. And in in it, I think you have to separate out who's saying it versus what's being said. And if you can do that, which is hard, but yeah. it, but if you can do that, uh, one of the things he talks about is this, which is uh, why would any nation state go ahead and now uh, increase their dependency or keep their dependency on a system which is dependent on the owners, the U.S. or, or G7 nations or whatever, continuing to be friendly to them, right? It, it, it's not only yeah. uh, that it happened to Russia, I think to your point – it's every country in the world now is asking themselves, whoa, hold on a second here. We're cool today. Yeah. Is there a world in the future where we're not cool? And even if I can't see that world, maybe I don't want to bet on us still being cool in the future. And I may do some things differently. Which brings us all the way back to the, the actual revolution, which is a decentralized ledger. So what he's saying is whoever controls the ledger has the power and it becomes a very political tool. And so we almost need a decentralized ledger that nobody can control, which is kind of what he was hinting at, I think. Um, and I think, you know, Russia is one of three global superpowers with nuclear weapons. So what chance do tier two, tier three nations have? None. 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 Zero. Um, how important is it that Russia's FX, uh, it wasn't just sanctions. You cannot uh, send this anywhere. So, for example, we just saw a G7 go ahead and ban uh, Russian gold, right? Yeah. Gold from Russia. Yeah. And they said, hey, we are not going to allow our countries to import this in. And so I think of that as almost the, the transacting of the asset. But that doesn't mean that the United States or any of the other G7s uh, took gold out of Russia, right? right? It's more so just we're going to keep it in your country and we're not going to do business on this uh, specific uh, transaction kind of rail. But also there was the seizing of FX reserves as well. And it's because Russia was keeping those reserves in other um, kind of custody, right? Outside of their own. We well, have no choice unless you print it out and put it in pallets in a, in a so bank. So this is going to be my question <clears throat> is in the legacy world, can you do self custody in any kind of scalable, uh, way? If you're a country with the types of assets and, and size that they have, you can with gold. But the problem is, is it's hard to move gold around. So Venezuela had gold, but they were keeping it in the UK vaults, but the UK seized $2 billion worth of Venezuela's gold. So then it's like, well, shoot, I guess I have to have my gold in my country. And so you start to see the problem that we have, and it gets to this drug dealer moment it's like, give me the drugs. No, give me the money. Right. And uh, so it gets very difficult to do business that way. 
I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think it just further proves like how do we move forward in a way where the world has global cooperation without the ability to pay on some sort of a rail that can't be seized. What is the difference between how countries are going to think about this and kind of analyze where the world is going versus individuals? Yeah. Or is it the same exact analysis? Well, I think uh, I think so now when we go back to adding the three cycles together, we have the financial revolution cycle. And so I think what we're starting to see really quickly, the world is being slapped in the face this morning. Japan announced they're coming back off that EV mandate. What we're realizing really quickly is that um, in a world where we print unlimited amounts of fake fiat currency, people want to buy real hard things. So mm -hmm. we have this commodity super cycle, right? We have this massive underinvestment into commodities. And now today we have this massive shortage and the central banks have found out very quickly, we can't print more energy or more food. And so the world has been slapped in this face. And so we're starting to see this kind of transition going back to that. And so I think that's kind of how the world is starting to be reshaped. And we're starting to see that real things are worth real like real things, right? And this feels like a continuation. If you go back to uh, COVID uh, early on, I think uh, Chamath Palapatiya, I talked with him and uh, one of the insights that he had almost immediately was, hey, the world, uh, but specifically the United States has pursued efficiency to the extreme. Yeah. And we've ran around the world looking for this efficiency and we found it. We found cheaper labor. We found uh, more efficient supply chains, uh, better manufacturing, all these different things. But in our pursuit of efficiency, we gave up the resilience that is necessary in moments like in COVID when yeah. you shut down the global economy, all of a sudden kind of the United States was exposed and we're like, damn, get those ships over here, yeah. right? Yeah. Get those materials here. We need to import certain things because we don't have the manufacturing or supply chain set up here in America. Yeah. And it feels like what you're talking about is a very similar uh, trend and it almost is a continuation of what we saw back in 2020. Yeah, well, it is, right? Because these cycles, they hit, but it's not like a, like a season. It's like summer starts on this exact day, but really the weather kind of changes plus or minus a month or two. So we're seeing a transition over this decade. It's not like it happens on a certain day. So for sure, it's it's all part of this. We've been transitioning for like the last seven years. Um, so it's certainly part of that. But um, there's other things at play as well. But as that continues to play out, also part of it is the Triffin's dilemma, as I'm sure you're aware, right? The nation that has a reserve currency has to be a net exporter, right? So we have to export dollars to the world, so which means we had to offshore all of our manufacturing. But also, because all that money printing was so inflationary, then we also had to offset that inflation by cheap, you know, outsourcing cheap labor, et cetera. Um, but I think that all that's coming to a head. Obviously, we can see it, right? And uh, the nations that have the assets are going to be the ones that move forward in the next decade. One of the big critiques of deflationary systems, so Bitcoin obviously being one on a structural basis, but but in general, uh, deflationary systems, is that you will kill velocity of money and you will kill uh, any sort of true economic growth. Right. Now, I always say, okay, let, that's one argument. There's another argument, which is, no, the loose monetary policy and the continued devaluation of a currency essentially is a financial incentive for people to get rid of the cash. So yeah. whether you invest or you consume, do it. And unfortunately, financial education is not uh, very pervasive in the United States or elsewhere. Yeah. And so most people, they consume uh, rather than go and invest in any material right. way. And so because there are so many people with this uh, cheap money that are sitting there ready to consume, it means that manufacturers could create less and less high quality goods and people are still willing to buy them. And so in some way, the devaluation of the currency and the loose monetary policy drove lower quality goods being flushed into the system. If we were to start to adopt a deflationary system, is it that the actual velocity of money would slow down? Or is it that people would only spend the money for the most high quality goods? And in some way, we would like wipe the, the bad consumerism and return back to this like high quality uh, goods and service based economy. These are super uh, in-depth conversations to have. And so you have to look at cost benefit analysis on a bunch of things. So for example, uh, Fiat uh, Safety and talks about Fiat money, Fiat food. And so in order to hide that inflation, we've had to make food cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. We've substituted for worse and worse products. Uh, McDonald's used to make their fries with tallow which was good for you. Now they make it with seed oils, which are very bad for you. And so in one of the pursuits of making things cheaper, now we're making ourselves more unhealthy. So now we're spending more on healthcare, right? And so there's a lot of cost benefit analysis there. But I think to your point about um, this inflation, or I'm sorry, the uh, velocity of money, they believe that we need to make people spend money because if we don't, they're going to hoard it. Really? I think people have no problem spending money. We all want more things, right? That's human greed. So we don't need any help spending money. We're already going to spend money. But I, this is a conversation I had last night at the conference. And I think uh, a lot of people say that we need um, without, if we were on a fixed monetary system like Bitcoin, then there's no credit markets. And without the credit markets, then the economy would expand very slow. The velocity would slow down because now I can't go buy 10 houses. Mm -hmm. I can't expand my business, go buy 10 trucks if I don't have the loans. 
and we don't know, it's academic, but maybe the story of the tortoise or the hare, and maybe the economy would grow slower, but more steady. And in, in a fiat money system, we have more booms and busts. And maybe over a period of time, we end up ahead. I, um, this, I hate to admit this because people will laugh, but uh, yesterday I was actually watching a speech from Peter Lynch, uh, okay. who ran the Magellan Fund at Fidelity for you know however many years. Uh, and he gave it, I don't know, probably two decades ago, it seems like, based on the quality of the video, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, uh, I think it was the Washington Press Club or something like that. And in it, he talks about, uh, you know, look, investing is really not that hard. Uh, corporate profits go up about 8% a year, and the stock market goes up about 8% a year. And like, the entire point of investing is if you buy something today, and it's still around 20 years from now, and it goes up about 8% in terms of corporate profits, right. like, the the math would suggest that this is also going to go up about 8% a year. And when you start to look at that, you're like, yes, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, that was 100% true. But that's not what we were seeing for the last two years uh, in this loose monetary policy. So in some way, the intervention into the market ended up really diluting what many people would have thought as like the traditional signals of value or value uh, accrual. Right. How do you think about asset markets or asset prices when there is this kind of manipulation of the market and not necessarily in a, a nefarious um, uh, pursuit as much as just like we feel as humans, we have to do something so we're in control. So let's intervene every time there's, you know, a bad time. Yeah. And then that ends up, you know, creating the, these kind of asset bubbles, if you will. Yeah. Um, Preston Push put up a chart yesterday that showed uh, central bank balance sheets and the S&P 500. And I mean, they just move in lockstep, <laughs> right? And so if you want to look at all the world markets and then, and then break them down into US dollar value and then break out the monetary issuance or expansion, then you see that we haven't actually gone up that much. Um, so I think it's pretty evident that the central bank balance sheets have a lot to do with these markets and these asset prices. And then um, at the end of the day, I think most people don't really understand the crux of the matter. And the crux of the matter is that we need food, we need energy, we need goods and services. Wealth is goods and services, wealth is not money. And so what happens is we get caught up in the US dollar valuation of these stocks. So he says it's going up by 8% a year, my stocks go up by 8% a year, that's great. But what, what we really want is we want our money to buy us more goods and services in the future. We want our cost, our, our you know, we want we want to be able to buy more things for doing less work, and so if our asset prices are only going up with the cost of inflation or the rise of the price of inflation, then we're not getting any more purchasing power. Yes. So we're really not any better off. In US dollar terms, oh, my house is worth more, my stocks are worth more, but if I sell my house at this inflated value, I can only go buy the same exact house. So I yeah. haven't gained any purchasing power. And the idea is something like Bitcoin obviously is different than that. It ends well, it up could be. It could be. And I, I, one thing I would say about Bitcoin is a lot of a lot of critics. I was the only per, only Bitcoin person at this event, so I have to deal with this all weekend. But a lot of people a lot of people expect it to be what it's what it could be in the future. They expect it to be that today. Mm -hmm. If we were walking through the forest and here's a little oak tree this big, I'm like, hey, Pom, check this oak tree out. Can you imagine this little thing's going to be giant one day? And you're like, no way. Look how small the thing. It'll never be big. It's like, no, it's an oak tree. It will be. No, it, it can never be right. And so like Bitcoin's on an evolution path. Uh, right now it's volatile, right? If you live in a third world country and you're trying to use Bitcoin every day and you're trying to, you know, put your money for food in that, like it's volatile and that could be dangerous, which, you know, maybe a lot of people think CB or not CBDCs, but stable coins could work in conjunction with Bitcoin in some of these countries. And so it's not the best, it's not the most stable currency today. So all these critics want to say it's not a good currency. Well, it, it's probably not today because it's super volatile, but it has been a good store of value if you can zoom out and look over a long period of time. So is it the best store of value over the last six months? No. Um, it's up 20% in the last seven days. Uh, it's down 65% in the last eight months, but it's also up 450% in the last 24 months. So it depends on what kind of time frame. So if you want to, it's, it's on its path to becoming a store of value. And then eventually I think you can move on to a medium of exchange. In your recent presentation, you talked about the idea of uh, Bitcoin, not so much a blockchain as much as a time chain, yeah. uh, which is a, a very unique concept. Yeah. Uh, explain what this means, time chain, not blockchain. So in Satoshi's white paper, he never used the word blockchain. And so, and uh, you mentioned earlier, is blockchain the revolution? And I'm guilty of that. Um, I got into Bitcoin in 2015. In 2016, I started writing a cryptocurrency newsletter. And for 2016, 2019, I published a thousand pages of research on cryptocurrencies. And I was like, hey, it's blockchain, it's not Bitcoin. So I, I was guilty. But after publishing a thousand pages of research, I was like, nope, that's not it. But back to the time chain. In the white paper, he used the word time chain. 
And uh, Gigi put out this article, how time is money, but money is time. And so time has an order of things. And so basically the time chain keeps order, keeps time of these blocks being added one time after another. And the importance of that, back to this revolution, it gives us this new ledger that keeps track of time and we can do all types of things that we don't know. So in a good example, as a consensus two weeks ago, I was down there in Austin and they announced, Dorsey announced Web5. Mm-hmm. Like it's whatever. It's Skip a meme. over Web4. It's a meme, right? But but what they introduce is with these DIDs, right? So Daniel Burr has been working with Ion Microsoft, right? And now these DIDs and these decentralized identifiers where I can control my ID, my data, instead of having to log in with Facebook or Google, I can now keep my ID, right? And they use the Bitcoin blockchain to put that hash in, to keep that record. So now we have this decentralized ledger that nobody can control and we can use it for things like a DID that we wouldn't be able to do that before. If we put it into a another chain that could be hacked or manipulated or whatever. So, so we're starting to see how this time chain can be used for other types of things like this DID. And when you think of the time chain, uh, one of the um, kind of nice things on Twitter that I've seen, which, which uh, every time I see it, it just makes me smile, even though I know what they're doing, uh, is a number of people I've seen recently announce the birth of their child and rather than say, you know, kind of the historic uh, uh, or historical uh, on this date, at this time, the baby was born, this, whatever, they just put what is the block? Mm, I haven't seen right? that. Oh yeah, yeah. What? What? Basically, what? What block was? You know it? what block your baby's on? I do. I do <laughs> not. Uh, to, to be honest, uh, with my first child, I was just making sure that the baby was yeah. there. My, uh, my wife was good. All that. But yeah. uh, when I saw, you know, people start to do this over the last couple of months, I was like, man, that is so cool. Yeah. Because now all of a sudden it's not like, oh, on uh, June 4th at 11.03 uh, p.m., yeah. uh, you know, Eastern time. And you're like, okay, GMT to EST. Like yeah. you just get rid of all that. The and it's just height. here is the actual block in which this occurred. And yeah. that block is the same uh, across the world, right? Which goes back to this idea of a time chain. And if you could almost standardize time, not based on uh, some sort of geography, which we have today uh, with time zones, but instead you can actually have a globally agreeable time. Mm -hmm. It's pretty powerful. Yeah, because if you think about uh, who keeps the ledger, so if we were both using the same bank account, we both had debit cards and we're in different parts of the world. So you run a transaction, I run a transaction, and then that ledger is trying to reconcile that. But to your point, we're in different time zones. So which transaction came in first? You're a day ahead of me, a day behind me, et cetera. And so it creates that problem. And Again, it's a building block. We don't know what can be built on top of it, but I hadn't really thought of that, but it, I think it's a great illustration. What's the craziest thing you think is possible? Right, obviously understand this is a building block and we can only see so far into the future. It's super foggy when you look too far, but like, yeah. what is the thing that you're like, you know what, I, I do think that this will happen. What I think happens more than anything is changing the incentive structures of the world. Um, in uh, Bitcoin Miami, um, Breedlove had a good conversation with uh, Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. And they talked about how if everybody's playing the game, everybody's playing together and everyone's productive because everyone's enjoying playing the game and they're all working together. But if half the people had to step out of the game to enforce the remaining half to play the game, you've lost productivity because now half the people have to force the other people. But also when they're forcing the other half of the people, they don't really want to play anymore. So their productivity goes down. And that's kind of the environment that we're in today. So imagine if we change the incentive structure to where everybody can play the game together, how much better the world could be. We have a, fi a fiat money system that's losing value. So we used to be able to save money in dollars. Today, uh, we used to, we, we've, uh, we've had progress because of the specialization of labor, right? So if I could be the best brain surgeon I could be, maybe I could change the world. But today I have to be half brain surgeon, half investor. Yeah, it, I talk all the time about, uh, we ask teachers to go be the best teachers in the world, go be the best accountant, go be the best right. marketing manager, whatever. And then, oh, by the way, nights and weekends, like become a great investor so yeah. you can protect your purchasing power. Yeah. Like that doesn't so feel we, So fair. we've lost massive mind share. So I, I look at how much different could the world be if everybody was providing value. As far as what technologies could be built, it's very difficult. Humans are horrible at imagining the future. We imagine better versions of today. We have cars, we have flying cars. So if you look at uh, books of the future from 50, 60 years ago, they envisioned us teleporting and spaceships. We didn't do that. They didn't envision, you know, iPhones and things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very difficult to say. Do you think that the innovation on top of Bitcoin will come from the Bitcoin community? Or do you think it'll be an outsiders who are looking for some technology and realize they can use Bitcoin, but they aren't necessarily quote unquote Bitcoiners in term, uh, as they create the innovation? 
Uh, probably eventually non-Bitcoiners, right? So I think what happens is I, I look at it like a TCP IP protocol and there's trillions of applications built on one protocol. And now we have a Bitcoin protocol and I believe there will be trillions of applications built on top of the Bitcoin protocol eventually. You know, like this Taro, for example, seems like a pretty cool option where we could maybe launch other tokens on top of that. A lot of Bitcoiners aren't super happy about that. But I think about like um, one of the big revolutions is keeping property in a way that can't be stolen from me. And if I want to send it to you, nobody can censor that, right? So think about before the internet, how did you have stocks? You had stock certificates. They were pieces of paper that I would keep in my safe. And if I had the stock certificate, a bare instrument or a bond, right, I would have that bare instrument. And almost if you could put assets back into bare instruments where I could hold them and we could exchange them freely. So I think that's probably a big innovation that could happen. And I think we'll start to see a lot of stuff come on that aren't Bitcoiners. Um, eventually, you know, they'll just be building companies. I, I was investing in the early days of the dot-com in the late 90s. And I remember at the time I was young, just starting my investing career, my roommate quit his job and we're trading these things called internet stocks. Everyone thought we were crazy. They never heard of these things. But today there's no such thing as internet stocks. They're just companies. Yeah. Uh, last thing I want to talk about is uh, Tara. I think it's a really interesting way to kind of th apply a thought process as to where this could be going. Uh, so for those that don't know, you have Bitcoin layer one. Uh, we then get layer two on top of that, trying to make it more scalable, cheaper, uh, faster, uh, which is Lightning Network. And now there's this idea uh, from Lightning Labs they put forward called Taro. Yep. Uh, and the idea is that you would be able to create all sorts of different assets on top of and tie into eventually the layer one of, of Bitcoin via- A decentralized uh, ledger. Correct. Yep. And so when you think about that, is- if the world does move to a fully digital world, which seems to be the the overarching trend over the last couple of, uh, of decades and, and centuries even, is it one ledger or do we end up getting multiple ledgers? And really it gets at this point of like the Bitcoiners that are upset or don't like the idea of, ta of tarot, is it because – they don't believe that other assets will become digital and need a decentralized ledger? Like, why, why are they not as excited about it maybe as the people who are working on it? Well, a lot of people believe that we don't need a bunch of tokens. We need one. And I would agree in a sense, right? So we need one money. We don't need a bunch of money. So, you, you know, you talk about business, obviously the best business show. And part of a business is to reduce friction. Yes. So you want to reduce friction as much as possible. I might have 15 minutes to kill and there's Dave and Busters and I might want to play a couple of video games, but I don't want to go stand in line and have to convert my dollars into the, into the stupid tokens. And I, and I don't. So there's friction. I won't even play, right? So we want to reduce friction. I could see they're having one money, but there are other assets. I'm, we're going to continue to have businesses. People are still going to want to invest into businesses. Like we're still going to have other assets. That, I don't see that going away. So the ability to own those assets, whatever they may be, shares of a, of a real estate property, shares of a company, um, I could see those other assets needing a way to own them and hold them and have custody of them. And so I think having tokens is a way to do that. It's so fascinating because uh, I've used the example in the past of uh, why do people invest to get more dollars, right. right? If you're in the United States. And so your, your whole idea is I'm going to take dollars. I'm going to put it in some other asset that is going to outpace uh, the growth or decline of the dollars. And then when I sell, I will get more dollars. Right. Uh, in the Bitcoin world, there's a lot of folks who think of it as I'm going to take my dollars. I'm going to convert it to Bitcoin, this decentralized uh, digital currency, and I'm going to hold that. But it's hard for me not to see a world where there's people who say, okay, I have Bitcoin and I have three Bitcoin. I'm going to invest so that something outpaces and then I get five Bitcoin. Yeah. And if Bitcoin becomes your reserve currency, uh, then naturally you're going to want more and more of it. And that of would course. be a, a uh, metric for gaining wealth. I think the critique of that viewpoint is what's going to outpace, you know, Bitcoin's 125% compounding of growth rate over the last decade. And so how do you think about that? Like, well, is it that the compound annual growth rate will go down over time and eventually you'll have to invest to get more? Or, or like, what do you think? Yeah, oh, of course. Of course it does. It can't keep going up like that at that rate forever. I, I go back to history. So how did it work on a gold standard? People saved gold, they consumed less than they earned, and they lent it out, right? And the rich people would lean, uh, lend to the kings and the governments, right? Go back and watch Game of Thrones, right? So the rich people are loaning money out. So people um, earn less than they consume, and then they um, loan it back out. And so people always do that. Obviously, at some point, uh, you know, we're gonna have to see that the uh, the rate of, uh, of increase is going to go down. Um, but I, I just go back to that. History shows us how it works, and people are always going to want to lend for more yield and to increase what they have. And we're going to need economic growth. People are still going to have ideas to create new products and new things and they're going to need startup capital to do that and people are still going to be willing to lend money for that yeah where can we send people to find you on the internet i feel like more people need to hear your ideas and, and kind of your thoughts yeah i think just go uh just on twitter at one mark moss the number one or just uh at one mark moss.com i have links to everything on there uh, i do a couple hours a week on iheart radio nationally syndicated radio show and the podcast and my youtube channel and on and on and on 
Um, I uh, just dropped a link in the chat for anyone who wants to uh, go follow him. Uh, last question actually is um, you always seem to be very high energy, similar to me. I try to be high energy all the yeah. time. <laughs> One of our sponsors is Eight Sleep. I okay. sleep on the Eight Sleep mattress. Love it. What's your sleep schedule? I see you have coffee. So what's your caffeine schedule? Yeah. And how do you keep high energy throughout the day? So um, I haven't tried that mattress. I got a, a, a sleep number bed and I've been sleeping in a hotel. I can't wait to get back <laughs> under my bed. Uh, about eight years ago, I read Tim Ferriss' book, Tools of Titans. And he talked okay. about this uh, this state that some people get in where this fog lifts off their brain into this crystal clear thinking. I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I want that. And it comes through fasting. And then you have ketones start going through your body and you get that. Um, and so I was like, all right, I'll skip breakfast. I'll do 18 hour fast every day. Uh, but I love breakfast. I don't know if I can do it. I'll, I'll, I can do it for two weeks. I'll commit to two weeks. And if I, you know, we'll see what happens. And that was eight years ago and I still do it every day. So I do have some coffee, but I don't eat. I so do about an 18 hour fast every what day. What time do you eat for the first uh, time? I usually say? eat about two o'clock, two, two or three o'clock. Um, so like two to eight o'clock or two so. Two to eight, usually like a six hour window. Got it. And then maybe twice a month, I do like a 24. So I don't eat uh, breakfast either. Do you eat more, the bigger meal? Uh, the first one or the last one? Uh, usually the first one. The first the, the one. lunch would be a really big meal, yeah. Yeah, and then you eat a smaller meal uh, yeah. for dinner. Yeah. I, I think that that's the only way to do it or I get too hungry and then I start eating crazy shit uh, Yeah, because <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for dinner. Yeah, so I think that's what really gives me the energy. It gives me that clear focus that I was after and um, it's, it makes it easy too because I don't have to think about what I'm going to eat every morning. Yeah, relentless. Yeah. That's the whole key. Yeah, exactly. All right, man. Listen, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, and we'll definitely have to get you on here more often because it's I think a pleasure. That, uh, you got a number of ideas that people would really benefit from. Yeah, thank you.